development approaches in East Africa's national parks. My name is Sandeep Bathala. I'm a senior program associate with the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The program, ACSP, is 19 years old, and we look at the various connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. Today's event is brought to you as part of our HELPS project, which incidentally stands for some of the words I just used, health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. That is a five-year effort generally supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. As many of you know, I see a lot of friends in the room. The Wilson Center is a formal memorial to our 28th president, the only president thus far to have achieved a PhD. And in his honor, we aim to bring the worlds of policy, practice, and academia together to better inform one another. You have the bios in front of you, so I want to direct your attention now to our moderator and two speakers. We have Steve McDonald, who's the director of the Africa Program and Project on Leadership and Building State Capacity here at the Wilson Center, who will talk a bit more about some of the work that the Africa Program does around national parks in Africa. We have Catherine Raphaelson. Raphaelson, I'm sorry about that. Senior Director of the Gorongosa Restoration Project. And then we have Dale Lewis, Director of Community Markets for Conservation at the Wildlife Conservation Society in Zambia. One quick note, and I know that Steve will probably reiterate this to you all. Today's event is being recorded. So when we do come to the discussion portion of today's event, please use a mic and introduce yourself and affiliation. So now I'll turn it over to Steve, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Sandeep. Um, welcome, everyone, again uh, by the, for the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for ECSP and, uh, and the Africa Program and the Project on Leadership and Building State Capacity. Um, we, I'm delighted to be uh, moderating and involved in this program for a couple of reasons. I won't go into great detail on the Africa program and what we do, except to say that one of our primary objectives and, and focus is, has been for a very long time conflict, conflict in Africa, post-conflict reconciliation, uh, prevention, and of course, in, and peace building and keeping in a larger sense. In fact, that's what originally brought me to the Woodrow Wilson Center, a former colleague of mine, Howard Wolpe, uh, who many of you probably know, uh, a former special envoy of the Great Lakes region for President uh, Clinton and I were, uh, were uh, working on a, a project to try to uh, rebuild trust and collaborative capacity amongst leaders in Burundi after the signing of the Arusha Accord. And uh, we ended up housing that program here. Uh, that's expanded to a lot of other places, DRC, Liberia, working, doing some work in Ethiopia now and other places on the continent. But um, uh, I find this subject matter that we're engaging in today to be directly relevant to, I hope that's not uh, <laughs> gonna, going to hurt anything, directly relevant to the kind of work we've been doing. Because obviously, um, the, uh, uh, the, the issues of land tenure and land use and uh, as a flashpoint in Africa often is one of the core causes of conflict that we have to work with. And management is managing a stable, a sustainable land use while ensuring responsible environmental wildlife management is critical to getting uh, to those root causes of conflict. And things like illegal poaching not only destroy protected and endangered species, but further fuel conflict uh, by creating income for the bad guys. I mean, witness, of course, how the M23 and large resistance army have both invaded and, uh, the Karamba and Virungu National Forest and DRC from which they, uh, uh, through their poaching, they use it as staging grounds as well, too, but through their poaching, they draw income for their own arms supplies and, and et cetera. Uh, so so the, the initiatives like the Peace Sparks initiatives, uh, which I'm pretty familiar with in Southern Africa and, and other trans frontier conservation uh, efforts serve to disrupt not only poaching, but trafficking and drugs, arms, and human beings. So, so it's, you know, it, conflict and, and the issues of uh, conservation are, are closely related. Um, I'm also just delighted uh, to have uh, these two people here who I'm only meeting for the first time today, but uh, both are working in areas that I'm intimately familiar with, uh, uh, having lived and worked in South and Southern Africa for a very long time. Um, and in fact, uh, I first visited Gorongosa uh, in, uh, in 1973. 1973, very different time then. Uh, war was still underway, uh, not yet independent. 
uh, and it was a pretty amazing. And so I'll be very happy to hear some of the changed environments there. Um, but anyway, um, that's all. I'm not going to reintroduce our guests because uh, you do have their bios before you. Uh, unlike the program, we're in reverse order. So Catherine is going to be speaking first, followed by Dale. And then we hope to engage you in a very productive discussion afterwards. Thank you. So as uh, you can probably see, um, Dale and Steve did not get the notice about the uniform for <laughs> presenters today. Sorry about that. I'm all fresh out of leopard skin. <laughs> cheetah, Steve, cheetah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm Catherine Rafelson. I'm with the Gorongosa uh, uh, Restoration Project. Um, and I've been involved with the project for nearly 10 years from the very beginnings. Um, but I have to mention that I'm only a tiny bit involved at this point because I've been winding down um, and just as of this week have taken a new job and I'm now the president of the Society for International Development, which I hope you all know about and if you don't, I can talk to you about it later. But I, I mention that because my involvement in Gorongosa in the last year and a half has been fairly small, really, from Washington, D.C., um, handling a lot of mundane things like USAID audits and not really doing the exciting stuff on the ground. And because of that, to fill in for me, I have um, corralled some of my former colleagues who are sitting here in the audience who, I, who can fill in when you ask the substantive questions that I can't answer. So uh, we have Scott Kipp, Amy Gambrell, and Bill Wright, who uh, all were very, very involved with this project. Scott actually lived in Gorongosa for quite some time, two different times. And uh, so uh, I'm going to defer to them for most things. But having said that, um, Gorongosa, for those who don't know, is in central Mozambique. And it's a park uh, about the size of Rhode Island that was decimated in a civil war. And um, with our project, we're trying to bring it back to life, rebuild tourism. It was once considered a real gem and a real destination point for Europeans. And uh, you know, you were there. Oh, well, you weren't there during it. Well, well it, it was still in pretty good shape, but yeah. it was being, beginning to be. Beginning to fall but, apart. But I still have it in Gorongosa, uh, Gorongosa book. That was published about 1970 by the Portuguese, which is the most beautiful yeah. book you've seen. Yeah. yeah. I should have brought it. Oh, yeah, that would have been great. So, so this project, the idea was to bring it back. And the way this project began um, was uh, a fellow named Greg Carr, um, who had made a lot of money in high tech, decided he wanted to do something with his money. And he thrashed about thinking, what, uh, what is one of the big problems of my day that when I'm an old man, I'm going to look back and say, you know, I should have done something about that. And he decided it was HIV AIDS. So he thought, I'm going to do something in Africa focused on HIV AIDS. And as he started to look into it, he realized he can't just do a health project. Because if he just focused on health, it, he would get nowhere. He, he had to uh, deal with the lack of education. He had to deal with the lack of opportunity. And he began to realize he had to do some project that integrated uh, health, education, and economic development. So. Um, Where's the, so, um, so he focused on Gorongosa. And uh, he made a 20 year commitment with the government of Mozambique, which is unusual. He also realized that he had to have a very, very long term approach in order to really make a difference. That started, uh, you guys can tell me what, about seven years ago, the commitment? We're about seven years into it. Uh, it's a public private partnership. And um, as I said, an integrated approach. As I mentioned, Gorongosa um, has some of the most amazing wildlife uh, on Earth. Um, I mean, some species that are, are um, considered to be endemic to Gorongosa, and just, just, it's amazing, but there are also a lot of people. Um, I think the figures I got today are that there are 120,000 people in the buffer zone and 5,000 people actually in the park. And while some people may be moved for the most part, 
we're, you know, we're, there's no plan to move the people. The plan is to work with the people. They are, of course, among the poorest people in the world, terrible health problems, and, um, and they're engaging in activities that are destructive to the park in order to survive. Uh, poaching, clearing uh, trees to build farms is terrible deforestation on Mount Gorongosa, and uh, there's all kinds of things. There are serious conflicts between the people and the wildlife. The elephants come and trample their crops, so they shoot the elephants. And, and, and so it, it's a challenge. Um, how do you help the people and help the wildlife and save the land? So um, these are the four main focuses of the project. Conservation, we're, we're bringing back the wildlife. We're uh, there's a whole program focused on the wildlife and on the, um, the uh, just every other part, the trees, everything. Uh, community, which I'll get into more later. Science, we have a lot of science research going on, and actually this is E.O. Wilson here. I don't know if you've heard of him, the ant expert. <laughs> uh, and he, uh, so he is um, doing a lot of research there, as are other scientists. And then tourism because um, Greg Carr is not going to fund this project forever. Um, the project also has a lot of funding from USAID and uh, a number of other places. EPOD, the Portuguese Development Organization, put a lot of funding into it. But none of that is going to, there has to be another plan. So the idea is all of this can lead to rebuilding tourism, which ultimately can sustain the park. Um, on the community side, uh, we're, we're focused on health. One big piece is health. And um, we're using the PHE model, population health and environment, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, and the idea that security of the environment is directly related to the population and the health of the people. This is a little clinic. Um, and we have an eco-health project that is funded by USAID, PEPFAR, Mount Sinai. And, and the Carr Foundation is also providing some funding. <coughs> These are people. Uh, gathered at a mobile clinic, um, so we have, um, I think, eight uh, mobile clinics in the last year that can reach, the, the park is very, very remote, and you know, some of the people that live in the buffer zones are just really hard, it's hard for them to get anywhere, by foot or by any means, and so these clinics actually go to them. And I don't know, I know when we were first proposing this, we even talked about donkey ambulances to get to them because some of them were so far away. I'm not sure that's actually happening, but it's that kind of creative approach to get two people uh, in these remote places and uh, provide health care, but also provide health education. And um, another part of the project is to, um, even though it's not specifically health care related, but to provide some economic development training, and, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but they're getting uh, a lot of the obvious stuff, um, pre and postnatal care, family planning, disease prevention, I mean, anything you can think of, better nutrition, sanitation principles and practices. And so this is a health training class that is in one of the communities. Um, another piece of the health project is community health workers, hiring and training people. This is a young guy in one of the communities and you get training um, in disease prevention and, and health promotion and also um, diagnosing malaria, for example, and basic treatment, but also interestingly in environmental conservation because it's all tied in. Um, so the, they're, they're always providing the same messages uh, that they're learning in the um, other parts of the park. Education, uh, this is a school that was built in a little town nearby, Vigno. Um, but more importantly, uh, we began to realize that what we needed to do was probably bring people to the park uh, as part of the education and actually focus on, uh, this is a community education center, but a huge amount of the education that takes place there is conservation education. And this is an amazing building, and uh, the person responsible for this building is Bill Wright there who can tell you all about it. It's a model of green design. and uh, so. We bring people in from the communities, children and adults, but a lot of children coming in for classes to teach them about conservation. And a lot of the health care has worked into the, um, those training classes. And, um, uh, and the idea is we can't get out to everybody, but there's, it's a combination of getting out and bringing them in. Um, this building, uh, USAID and EPOD, the Portuguese 
uh, aid organization helped to build it. And it was built in co a couple of years ago, so three years ago, I guess. So it's, it's underway. Um, I gather there are three to four day seminars taking place there. There's dorms and everything that kids can stay in. Uh, and these are some of the messages that are preached both in the uh, classes taught at the Community Education Center, by the healthcare community workers, um, by the mobile clinics. Everybody is preaching anti-poaching, anti-logging, controlling fires. They're also uh, talking about environmental health. There are water and sanitation challenges. They have to teach people about latrines and water treatments. And then uh, they really need to teach people how to have other livelihoods um, beyond what they're used to in order for this all to come together and um, for this conservation project to succeed. So um, the economic development piece, uh, these are uh, women in the park who are taking capulanas, the cloth, and they are making them into um, gift bags, and they make um, uh, wine bottle holders and all, all kinds of stuff, placemats, shoulder bags, um, and they're given training in how to do that. And actually, that's part of the EcoHealth project, so it's part of the health project that's taking place. Um, they're being trained, materials are brought to them, and then actually, I gather, I just learned this yesterday, that we buy the goods from them and sell it to third parties to really help boost their business. Um, other activities that are taking place now, beekeeping, um, tomato preservation, commercial agriculture. Uh, the beekeeping, we had 72 farmers trained and equipped a couple of years ago. Uh, apparently only half managed to succeed or to produce honey in the first year, but they, they earned $30 that year, which was a big deal. The second year, I gather, it failed due to lack of rain. So there are a lot of challenges that are being worked through, but trying to get people to think about things other than poaching and cutting down trees for these sad little farms that don't, don't really succeed, so then they have to move and cut down more trees. Um, uh, Shade-grown coffee has not started. It's something that has been tossed about for a while. Again, the idea is if you get people to do coffee, which requires shade, they're not going to cut the trees. Um, one piece of the project is that 20% of the tourism revenues go back into the communities with the requirement that they spend them in a certain way uh, that's dictated by um, these natural resource management committees made up of community people. Um, so they have to be spent in a way that benefits the communities. And some of the ways that they have spent this in the past have been to um, create meeting spaces for community leaders or for their natural resources management committee, um, to buy uniforms for community-based rangers, um, and they're coming up with other ideas constantly. Uh, some of the health workers that we work with are members of these committees. So this is an interesting model. I, and I guess so far uh, they've, they've received, because the tourism is really just coming back, so it's not substantial revenue yet. Um, so far they've received two payments uh, for a total of about 3,500. And, and part of the idea there is for them to see the value to them in the tourism so that they want the tourism to succeed and understand that they need the animals and the trees and the mountain and everything in order for the tourism to succeed and how that's going to help them. Uh, other things that, that we have done that are more obvious is actually hiring um, people to work in the park, training them to become park workers. Um, but one interesting story that some of you may know more about than I do is we've taken creative approaches to discourage people from poaching, for example, and one of the worst poachers in the park was caught, and um, I've heard this from a few sources, but you guys may be able to correct me, was, was rehabilitated or trained to become a restaurant worker, and now is a guide in the park um, who takes people out to see the, the animals. I mean, I'm talking about Tato. So, uh, and then um, there's some other plans. They're trying to get some of the illegal fishermen uh, on the river with their canoes to, to retrain them to be guides for tourists on the river. So, um, tr really trying to get people to see the park as a, as a concrete value for them. So again, there are a lot of people in and around this park that need to be there. They're not going anywhere. 
and uh, we need to engage them to keep Gorongosa or bring Gorongosa back to what it once was. That's it. Well, thank you, and it's a great uh, pleasure to be able to be with you today and um, talk about uh, our work in, in Zambia. My name is Dale Lewis. Um, as some of you may know, um, I've had a, a very long tenure of wildlife conservation um, in Zambia, and I, I started as an elephant uh, conservation, uh, conservationist working for the Wildlife Conservation Society, and, and I've ended up being the CEO of a food processing company. Um, <laughs> it's a fairly um, convoluted story and a very radical change of uh, career path. But, um, um, well, I do wear, you know, different hats, but my real hat remains uh, conservation. Um, what really um, has changed, though, has been my uh, approach or, or my thinking about conservation, which has come about really from an appreciation uh, empathetic appreciation of the, the real plight of uh, small-scale farmers, uh, the challenges that they face, um, and some of the reasons why they uh, often have to turn uh, to poaching uh, and to other livelihoods that are uh, destructive often to themselves or can also be destructive to the environment. And as, as we probably all know, uh, many of the, the causes for these problems are uh, often food security and poverty or just reasons to just, you know, get by and, and somehow make a living. Uh, another reason that we may, may also be aware of is the fact that it is so um, easy to exploit um, uh, farmers who are uh, uneducated and, and often illiterate by the private sector. Uh, at least in the part of the world where I come from, um, the private sector can be really predatory. Um, I'd like to give you an example, um, and it's not a unique example. Um, I, I think it's actually quite typical of uh, a lot of the problems that we face when we, we started our, our, our work that I'm going to be talking about. I was doing a survey, market survey, of um, the linkages between markets and uh, small farmers, and I asked a certain businessman who had been uh, quite successful uh, buying commodities, um, ground nuts, rice, soybeans, from uh, the communities that we'd been working with uh, with our elephant work. And I asked him, um, you know, how did you, how do you do your business? You know, thinking that, that this might be a direction that I would go. And how do you do, how did you do your business and how did you get to be so successful? And he said, well, Dale, uh, there's only one way you can do this business. If you're going to really make a lot of money, you know, you got to get your trucks ready. You got to get into these communities um, just when the farmers harvest their crops. Because you see, they've, they've, they've been farming, they don't have any money. And so if you get in there very quickly, they're very desperate and they'll sell their crops to you for nothing. And you'll just make a huge profit. Did I hear that correctly? I mean, is this the way the private sector relates to farmers? It, my goodness. Um, I mean, no wonder uh, farmers don't have uh, the incentive uh, to farm. And no wonder they're bad farmers. And no wonder they you know, don't have enough food to feed themselves. And certainly no wonder why we were finding at the time between four and 5,000 wild animals being snared or hunted illegal every year. Well, <laughs> that was pretty much the status quo uh, at the time. Again, about 10 years ago. And so what do you do? How do you turn the status quo around? How do you change this? Um, and I ask you, what do you do? Got to do something. So we said, well, the only way we're going to get this problem solved, it seemed to me, was to get in there and fight it out in the market. Uh, we've got to offer the farmers um, a better deal than 
trading uh, game meat on the illegal market. We've got to offer, you know, a better deal that can get the farmers that we work with in a, a safer and better place so they don't poach. And um, so that's, that was a very naive, um, important revelation, revelation, but it was naive, I guess, at the time. I'm glad we were very naive because we probably wouldn't have done it otherwise. But we sat down with the community leaders and said, you know, let's do this. Now, we'll put down our binoculars, we'll stop watching elephants, and we'll get in there and help you with inputs, we'll help you with uh, education, skills to be better farmers, and we will, we will bring in the markets. But the deal is, you know, you put down your guns and snares, pick up your plow, and let's really make a company work that's never been thought of or done before. Let's really create something really special. Um, that was our dream. And, you know, probably a lot of people thought, well, well, you know, he'll be around maybe for a year or two, but this thing ain't going to take off. Well, make a long story short, um, 10 years later, we are a, a food company that's been running, um, one of the best food processing companies in the country. Um, we buy those ground nuts. Uh, we buy those that rice, those soybeans, and we, rather than selling them as a commodity product, which you can't really make much money, we add value. We manufacture them into processed pr products, and we sell them as top quality, healthy, nutritious products, put them in every supermarket all over the country in Zambia. Now I'm going to turn into my salesman pitch, and here is one of the products. <laughs> We've got about 12 different products. This happens to be the world's best peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> Under the brand, it's wild. It is absolutely so good that I'm tempted to open it up and let it, you know, pass it around. I don't know if I should or not, but it is so good. Uh, <laughs> I'll pass it around. Um, but what's more important is that we've added a value to the commodities that we, um, two to three times from what they were when we started this. Um, we have given back so much in terms of economic incentives for farmers to be motivated to grow, to gr be good farmers, to grow more, not only for themselves, but actually to help feed the country. It's, it's, it's really, um, you know, quite exciting. But the other thing is that we've developed um, a partnership with the communities that we work with, a partnership that has become a business. They're partners to this nonprofit company. Um, and more importantly, they're now part of the mission of trying to really be better stewards, better guardians of their natural resources. So today, um, my talk, um, how peanut butter and other products uh, have changed uh, livelihoods, conservation, and health in Luango Valley, I'd like to talk to you about this, uh, the farmers that we work with, um, the product that we put on the shelf, and, and, and how we've explored the links between uh, markets, um, agriculture, conservation, and health. The company is called Community Markets for Conservation, um, or Kamako. And it's, it's a very interesting kind of company because it's, it, it really consists of two uh, parallel um, synergistic uh, divisions or sections. Um, one, one section is really very much about uh, farmer support services. Um, in which we provide a great deal of, of technical input, seed inputs and skills to help them uh, get out of their food deficit and where they have a surplus that they can put that surplus into a value chain that the other section of the company uh, takes over and, begin, and, and promotes through its, uh, the brand It's Wild. And um, currently, um, over the past mm -hmm. uh, eight years or so, we've developed a farmer membership that's become our uh, producer base of um, roughly 66,995 members, I believe. This year we're gonna do, a, 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 we have done a turnover of about 2.8, 2.7 uh, million US dollars in sales. Uh, the brand uh, is very widely known throughout the country. We've got a lot of equity built in that brand and there's a lot behind that brand besides just good quality 
it's a it's a product that really is helping small farmers and not only that helping small farmers look after their resources um, we cover an incredibly large area and it's it may be even hard for you to imagine this and I sometimes have difficulty imagining it as well um, we are operating in the um, very pristine wildlife important area of Luango Valley uh, in the eastern part of Zambia and we, we also work in very remote areas the roads are terrible and if you stop to think about you know where we work and that we're competing with very sophisticated companies um, often with uh, imports that come up from South Africa with very sophisticated managers and inventory systems and everything else we've had to literally start from scratch <coughs> Um, so we cover a big area, um, that's right, I have a pointer. Um, the white areas, sorry, are, are areas that we are actually operating. The green areas are the national parks, the Luangwa Valley. There are some gaps that we hope to fill in. Um, let me introduce some terminology because I'm very interested in supply chains. Um, supply chains is very much a part of, of our model and I'll get to that later. But our farmers are organized into producer groups for various reasons. It's a, it facilitates the knowledge exchange. It facilitates how they can consolidate and bulk their products. Associated with uh, every three to four producer groups is a lead farmer that helps them prov provide year-round uh, service of training, but also helps them to get those raw materials bulk so we can get them into our pipeline. And down that pipeline it goes, into the bulking stations uh, where an invoice is issued, uh, to the depot where the transaction occurs right in the community and then from there it goes into our regional um, centers either for storage or for manufacture of the products and we have about 12 different products um, and then on to our sales and distribution centers so that's sort of roughly the supply chain um, we are very much focused as well on trying to transform people transform people away from practices that are dangerous to their environment and even to themselves. And a lot of these, a lot of these uh, challenges and environmental threats are very much about, or originate from bad farming practices that force people to clear land along the hillsides or unnecessary clear forests because they can't stay sedentary and farm in one location. Or they just give up farming and they, they just um, uh, uh, have a, uh, totally unsustainable business of cashing in on their natural resources, whether it's wildlife or charcoal. And some of the unfortunate consequences of this are the downream effects of flooding. And you find um, periodically very extreme flooding because of the upriver effects of their farming practices. Um, so um, um, I can do this one or two ways. I can really whiz through this very quickly, or I can probably bore you, but I can try to explain to you how the model works. So if you don't mind, I'm going to bore you a little bit because this is probably the slide that may bore you. <laughs> so I'll prepare you. Uh, um, but um, this, this is really the way it works. And, and, it, and, and again, as I re if you recall, there, there are two major sections. There's a section that deals with uh, the farmers and, and the business. And that part of the business that deals with the farmers, it's non-commercial. It is part that's uh, completely um, dependent on the... Um, the good funding that we get um, from USAID, which we've just received a Global Development Alliance uh, grant that's been going for a year now. Also help from the Norwegian uh, Embassy as well. Um, and the business is largely from its own revenues, uh, some grants for some salaries, uh, also very significantly from loans that we get. So that's sort of how, how it's split. Um, um, this system also, let me just explain, is, is, a, is a replicate. We, we work with chiefs in Zambia. We work with over 50 different chiefs. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, is in every single chief's area, at least with the farmer activities. And you know, communities are different. You've got different kinds of chiefs, different kinds of levels of education, um, local leaders and all that. So there, there's a lot of variation to, to the degree that this model can work fast or slow or successfully or not so successfully. But very much it starts with a farmer. So for example, I'm going to talk to you about um, Mizozi Sakala. Um, she, she's one of, um, again, roughly 70,000 farmers. I'm going to talk to her uh, because she's actually, uh, in fact, a lot of our farmers, over 50% the, over are women. Um, she has, um, she's married um, and, and she has three kids. And 
She lives about 250 kilometers from Lusaka uh, in Chief Luimbi's area, um, way off the road. And they couldn't make it. Uh, they knew they had a problem that they, um, excuse me, they weren't going to be able to uh, send their kids to school uh, given what levels of income that they had. So they decided as a couple, husband, you go to Lusaka. Look for work. I'll stay here with the family. And we'll see what happens. Very typical. Not unusual. And so one day, very fortunately, one of our lead farmers and Mizozi uh, met up. And um, Mizozi got interested. And so she signed up in one of the producer groups. Okay, so she's somewhere here. And she, she took uh, the very basic training, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we, we trained them to, to learn. And, um, and, and then when she um, went through that, we gave her 15 kgs of groundnut seeds, a legume. And she realized from our uh, discussions at the group, group level how much money she could make. Now, being a mother and being very concerned about how she was going to pay the bills, she realized, well, if I sell my chickens, um, I'm very grateful for the 15 kgs, but that's not enough with the money that I want to make. So she sold 20 chickens and, and got another 20 kgs of groundnuts, and she farmed a whole hectare of groundnuts. Um, she's been an excellent uh, model farmer. She will no doubt be one of our lead farmers. <clears throat> so um, she called up her husband and said, husband, um, I think we're going to make it. Um, let's, can you come back? And, and, and I think with, uh, with Kamaka, we, we're going to have a good future. So that's, um, that's how we, we work. And, and Ms. Ozzie now will take her harvest very soon. Uh, in about a month and a half or so from now, she'll take her harvest, having gone through the training, she's got a good yield, she'll take her harvest to uh, one of the bulking centers. And then the business team, totally different group of people, will take over. And they will uh, make a transaction, and then that raw material goes into um, a processing where there are a lot of different things that go on. There's food quality control, there's we do quite a bit of pr uh, product development with some of our partners. Um, uh, manufacturing, processing, packaging, bulking, shipping, um, all of that is what, what goes on, accounting, um, and eventually to uh, sales and distribution. Um, marketing is very important um, because we depend very much on the consumer. So the consumer is right over here, and by being very I think savvy, trying to get a good brand, a good logo, and marketing on TV, radio, newspaper. We've built up now a good consumer base, and they're now beginning to pay premium price. Well, that premium price, and not being a for-profit company, we pass on the best price we can, which is consistently above market price for the consumers that we work with. So it, there's an iteration. It, it goes on year after year. Now, here's an important point about the model I want to emphasize. that that as you build this consumer base and farmers are now beginning to get themselves out of this hole that they've been in and they, they, they have a little time and space to think about the future, you will see a whole community begin to transform. And with a little bit of prodding here and there, you can get a community to think about other conservation targets. And collectively, we'll think about what those targets might be. Could be uh, an area that they'll set aside as a, as a protected forest, their protected forest. They'll, they'll, they'll say, well, we've got three poachers over here. They've been very difficult. They have shot three or four elephants this last year. And we say, well, I'm sorry, but we're not going to come back next year unless you, it's your problem, you sort these guys out, hand over their guns, let them join one of our groups, and stop your poaching. So we have never arrested a single person, by the way. This is all peer pressure, community, collective commitment to the deal. But it happens after three or four years. So that's sort of how it works. What we don't want them to do, one of the, the kind of farming that we're discouraging and we move them away from, has been uh, what we refer to as more monoculture, uh, non-food crop, primarily cotton or, or tobacco. Generally, the way they farm these crops are, uh, are generally har harmful to the soils. And there's a um, very high rate of land clearing as they move on after they deplete the nutrients. 
or in many cases where people simply just don't understand how to farm or understand how to manage the soil's fertility and keeping the soils healthy enough that you can sustain crops and a good yield to feed yourself from. And so that kind of crop would, would look pretty much like this, full of weeds. What we do work toward is this kind of farm. And this is a very interesting picture because what you don't see is the science that's going into this. There's a lot of sophisticated science. Here's a guy in Ohio State University, Rattan Lau, who is one of the premier soil scientists who introduced us to, to this tree, agroforestry. Um, great deal of, of research that's gone into uh, near zero tillage that's come out of the, um, come out of the depression, um, the, um, what do you? Dust Bowl. One? Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl, thank you, out of the Dust Bowl days. And, and so there's a lot of technology from various universities of how to do near or zero tillage. Um, um, it, it's really fascinating, but we do it in, in, a, in, a, in a very non-technical way for someone who's illiterate to learn, and I'll get to that how we do it. So there is, a, there is a science to how to manage your soils and keep it so healthy that in theory, you don't have to leave. You can be resident permanently farming that plot or almost permanent. So you don't have to be cutting down the trees every third or fourth year. So there's a great deal of work that's been done with um, agroforestry. This species, um, I didn't mention it, is called Gliracidia sepium. And it's fascinating. And what we've learned from the women who gave us this idea was that um, this was in October, and they're getting ready to plant. They would plant in November. And obviously, these trees are too high, would block the sun. So in, uh, the way this works is they would cut these trees and lay the branches down, and the leaves would fall off. Now, what's going on is quite interesting. Again, Rockton Law, Ohio State. We got these micronutrients way down there, deep in the soil. Those micronutrients come up or in the leaves. The leaves fall, they decompose, and you get those selenium, uh, uh, I don't know, all those different minerals and elements. You know, I can't even think of what they are, but they're important for the plants to be healthy. And then on the top layer, we've got the macronutrients because these are, uh, these are nitrogen and, and potassium, uh, phosphorus uh, fixing tr uh, trees. Um, once the, dry, the stems are dry, they gather them up and they use them for firewood. And for a, a, a field that's about a quarter of a hectare, they've got two or three months of fuel wood. So all sorts of things are going on, but the idea is to in, in improve the fertility, composting. In theory, we make our own fertilizer. And if you monetize what they're able to make themselves, there's a great saving, which we haven't even put into the equation for how much money that we've added to their actual net income, legumes and increased yields. So in short, um, everything's about the brand, about helping farmers have a better life while conserving their natural resources. And every have three main partners. Uh, farmers, if they can commit themselves, strengthen the brand. We make the product so that the consumer will buy it, recognizing that they're buying more than just a good, healthy product. And, and this continues to grow and makes the brand stronger, more competitive, and we slowly take over market share. It is, baby, it's all about business when you get to this point. It's market share, and you got to get that shelf placement. When we started, we were way down here. Every one of our products now, eye level. So it's... it's <laughs> Okay, one of the things that, that um, I'm, I'm actually really interested in um, is, is the supply chain and how do you get this thing right. And our experiences has been, um, um, <clears throat> you know, we do everything just about wrong the first few years. And you learn, um, but when you get to this scale, you've got to really learn quickly. So again, back to this area, um, we, this shows you the distribution of most of our bulking centers. And, um, and, and you have a team, you've got a very focused uh, plan, you've got your cashiers trained, your security officers, your, all of your paperwork, you've got your, your uh, internal audit. You, you, it's so easy um, to, to lose crops along this very circuitous pathway of getting it all the way down to where we distribute and sell. And to, sh and to, uh, to illustrate that point, this slide is, is quite interesting. This is our revenue, okay, and doing pretty well. And this is what we have paid for the commodities. 
Um, if you look at the difference between these years, um, and then you look at the difference between here, it says, well, well, you didn't really buy that much more commodity, but man, your revenue really shot up. Well, the reason for that is, once we had the sort of systems in place and we could track our shrinkage, how much loss, we were losing up to 20%. Last year, we got it down to seven. This year, we're hoping to get it down to 3%. Very painful lesson. But um, data and monitoring what we're doing is very much part of this model. Get it right. So the environmental trends. Um, won't talk too much. I mean, I could talk all day, but we've been comparing Kamako areas and non-Kamako areas. These are two interesting images. This is what we call NDVI, non-determinate vegetation index, where you look at the change in vegetation. And it's a little bit simplified, so you can see the, the pattern. But this is a non-Kamako area. And these are uh, actually two chiefs, Masampangui, a woman chief, and Chikamini. Um, the green indicates uh, a positive change in vegetation. Red changes the other direction. So we got a very good recovery. And this is all farm area, OK? This is where we got a lot. We've got um, over 10,000 beehives. Um, we, we, there's no one who, who buys honey uh, as much as we do. I mean, we've got beehives all over the place. Um, people, we've, part of our farming system, we put a fire break um, around their plot so they don't, they don't burn the, the mulch. They're not burning, you know. We've got a good chief, another good chief, over here at non Kamaka. If you look at the fires, it reinforces that picture. non Kamaka area, red means a lot of, this is uh, accumulated over five years of data, sorry. This is MODIS satellite data. Yellow is low. Again, very good pattern. And we see this in more and more areas, and we're getting more sophisticated about how we can track what we're actually impacting on. Um, to me, this is like five dead elephants. This before, it was all denuded, and they were farming along the hillsides. Bad. No habitat. It's recovered because down below, farmers are now sedentary, and they let this area go back to forest cover. And we're seeing this. This is more on the western side of the valley where a lot of the water actually comes from. This map may be difficult to see, and it's uh, maybe difficult to interpret. Um, but um, the light brown is Kamako. The red spots are elephants that we counted. And you won't be able to see them, actually. It's not a good picture. I apologize. But little um, uh, empty circles are, are carcass, fresh carcasses. And this was done in 2012. Up to 2009, elephant numbers were definitely increasing. We've had an increase in poaching, unfortunately, this past year, 2012. And it's not surprising. The, the, the price of ivory in the black market has really shot up. But if you look at the, the areas where we find most of the carcasses, they're associated with where Kamako is not operating. These are the dark brown areas. Um, give you some idea of the numbers of snares and guns that we've, um, we've had surrendered from the farmers. So let me give you a little bit of uh, a brief oversight on our impact that we've had. And again, we, we, know, we knew when we started that um, we had um, very significant levels of hunger and poverty affecting very 30, 40, 50% of the population that we're dealing with. Um, um, we knew we had a nutrition problem, uh, under five children, uh, under age uh, children, under age five children, under, underweight. Um, very few health outposts um, and so forth. And so keeping that in mind, I, um, one of the things that we've realized in sort of hindsight, this is very interesting, when you sort of, you know, you step back and you look at what you've done and you say, wow, I didn't realize we did that, but, but we have. In fact, what we've done is that this is um, the supply chain, farmers, consumers, and we think of supply chains generally as raw materials going to the consumer, right? But what we've also created is a backflow of opportunities of getting things back through the whole same system back to the families where we actually get our raw materials in terms of knowledge, in terms of social support. I'll talk to you a little bit about that, but that's a very significant part of our model because that's how we get partners that really want to see an, op they see an opportunity of, of getting involved with Kamako and adding another layer of potential impact from other ways that we can enhance the social welfare. Um, we've got 
great data on, on increased food yields. Very conservatively, we've been increasing food yields to 30 to 40 percent, in some cases over 100 percent, but those are the outer liars. Increased income, uh, let me just back up one, well, I've missed it. Um, the cost of providing uh, service to our farmer is about 30 to 35 dollars per year. That's what it costs from, from our work of helping farmers. And the income lift uh, has been steadily going up. This past year, the income lift has been about $140. So just from Kamako revenue, of those farmers that had surplus, um, which cost $35 on average, we can get an income lift of about $140. But that's only from the Kamako revenue. If you monetize everything else that we could, the lift is actually very much more, $300 to $500. So from a donor perspective, of, of investing in a, in a model that can get that kind of impact without having to spend so much money on a large scale, this model is becoming very interesting. Increasing crop diversification, adoption of our agriculture is about 65%. We, we monitor this independently with smartphones and go out and verify what farmers have done or not done, and we sample about 20%. And um, finally, I would just say that the groups that we work with, it's a, a critical opportunity, critical feature of the model is to bring people together so they feel more empowered to be with their friends and to share knowledge helped by the lead farmer, and particularly with the women. We find that women have been able to really uh, become much more engaged and active with asserting themselves, learning, and being more involved with making money and making decisions about how to use the money. Um, one of the tools that we have, um, um, actually I think I brought a copy, um, is a book. We, we published a book called, <laughs> called The Better Life Book, and um, it's a pictorial book that makes it possible for any, even someone who's illiterate to at least get some idea about, but it requires somebody to have a little bit of education to explain it. I'll even pass this around. But uh, the pages inside are referred to as learning pages, and so the pages have all sorts of topics. Uh, poultry, how to keep a beehive, uh, you know, how to grow ground nuts, um, how to improve your nutrition, how do you, you know, um, have safe sex, well, we talk sex, uh, and family planning and, 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 uh, and family health is a very important part of our Better Life book. Um, and it's the lead farmers that help direct the use of these books, and it's incredibly popular. What we're going to be doing this year is to increase the awareness of, of this, all these different topics and to get people to think about it through a radio program that we're going to call Kamako Farm Talk. Um, I borrowed that from NPR um, fart, uh, Car Talk, so I, I plagiarized that a little bit, but uh, I hope they don't mind. Finally, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the point I made earlier about how Partners take advantage and work with us because they see an opportunity. Um, the Balance Project together with the Flex Fund saw an opportunity of working through our system and using our groups and our lead farmers um, as adult peer educators to um, explore ways that we can introduce family planning. It's something that we've really always wanted to do, but obviously we didn't have that kind of background. And um, an opportunity came and, and these partners <coughs> We heard about each other and got together, and we, we really started something that we want to continue to follow through on. But basically what we've discovered is, again, through the Better Life book, is that women, men, I mean, they don't talk about reproductive health. You know, they do it, but they don't really understand about it. what are the consequences and, and how to control uh, family size and, and how to protect yourself from having too many frequent uh, births. And women were incredibly appreciative and we went beyond that to work with the Ministry of Health to allow the lead farmers to be the agents of distributing family planning products. It was really a breakthrough for us and in some areas where it was very successful, it was very successful. In other areas we didn't carry it through as well, so we've learned some lessons. Other partners, um, General Mills, I think we all know about Cheerio. They, they, uh, very wonderful company, uh, wonderful people, and they've been just outstanding partners in helping us with various technologies. And Cornell, I'm going up to Cornell tomorrow, actually this evening, and we'll be uh, visiting with some collaborators up there. And I, I cannot thank USAID enough 
mm -hmm. um, as well as the Norwegian Embassy for sticking their neck out and, and, and giving us some, some really needed support so we can scale up our farmers. And with their support, we'll be adding uh, 40 to 50,000 more farmers. We'll soon be over 100,000 farmers. Am I, I've gone over my time limit, I think. Far and away. Far and away, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, okay, there are no take home lessons, sorry. <laughs> oh, hey, we haven't learned anything. Um, you know, look, um, it's not easy. Um, you got to have a great team. You got to have real professionals. Um, you're going to have problems. You got to learn how to get back up and don't get discouraged. You got to get capital. You got to find that capital because this is not the kind of business that most investors will invest in. Most investors want to see a return in three years. This is a, like a 10 year uh, commitment. Donors have to be realized if they want to do something like Kamako, it's a whole nother kind of concept of how you integrate all this to make it fit together and work. Um, if I may, um, I'll make one more pitch. Now, this is the cereal of a lifetime experience. Oh, here it is. This is a cereal that is so good that I can even tell your mouth is watering right now. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from farmers who never even heard of soybean. Now, how many cereals do you know have soybean, rice, and maize? Three grains, no pesticides, and with uh, added vitamins and nutrient uh, minerals, 13 to be precise. Um, but what's so cool about this product is um, uh, it took two years, is on the back side we tell a story about Thompson Timbo, the poacher. And believe it or not, I've had so much feedback from parents who kids just love reading about Thompson Timbo. And, and on the front is Ellie the elephant. So we're getting into sort of Walt Disneyland, and we're going to have Ellie the elephant and, and Tommy the poacher becoming good friends on TV. <laughs> so I want you to see Ellie the elephant for real. I don't mind eating any healthy cereals, and I don't even care if they give me diabetes, hypertension. Hey! Don't be ridiculous. Try telling that to your wife and kids who care about you. You don't have to eat unhealthy cereal anymore. There's now a new great tasting cereal that's good for you. It's a 100% all natural healthy multigrain cereal that's low in fat and sodium but high in protein. And it tastes great. Sweetie, it's wild cereal. It cracks me up every time. <laughs> Thank you. Zambia's first breakfast cereal. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Lots better than uh, uh, jet oats from uh, South yeah. Africa. <laughs> okay. Well, normally I'm a, a harsh taskmaster, but uh, but your your presentation was so so uh, compelling that I didn't uh, crack the whip on you. But, thank uh, you so much, Steve. Uh, no, thank you, Dale. <laughs> Um, now, to remind, uh, uh, and I, I want you all to be patient because I know people get really excited and want to get engaged, and so you start speaking before that microphone gets to you. Don't. And I want to caution you guys, too, to speak in the microphone. I was a little bit worried about you, Dale, standing so far back, because remember, we are being webcast, and the audience out there may not hear you if you're not on that microphone. So also introduce yourself first uh, before you do it. We have staff who are ready to run those microphones to you, and we recognize you. Uh, comments, uh, discussion, uh, questions, everything is... Uh, the floor is open for everything, but I'm going to start. I don't always do this, but uh, uh, but because I did uh, spend so much time in Gor 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 Gorongosa uh, in the past, and also uh, because I was there, just uh, this is about 10 years ago. I've been there much more recently than that. But but at that point in time, we were talking about doing a peace park with. Uh, with Kruger, mm -hmm. Gorongosa, and and the corner of Zimbabwe there. Uh, has there been any progress on that? What has happened? I think it was stymied at that time because of political problems within Zimbabwe. Um, yeah, that has not happened. Um, that, that has not happened. And uh, mm -hmm. I haven't heard any more about it in, in several years. Mm -hmm. I, I'll ask my gang out here, does any of you know anything about where that is? I, I haven't heard talk of it in probably five or six years. So I think it, it remains okay. stalled. All right. <laughs> okay, that's that answer. Now let's open the floor. I see a hand right at the back. If we can have a microphone there. Identify yourself. Hi, I'm John Pielemeyer. I've uh, done a lot of work in Africa and, and in Latin America with environment programs. Um, I, I'm glad to see the Education Center at Gorongosa. I happened to stop there when I was working on another project evaluation about eight years ago. It was taken to a little shed where there were flintlock guns and snares, 
uh, and the uh, and one sort of uh, sort of flimsy little window, and uh, the guy who cl claimed to be the conservation director closed the door, and, and we had a little bit of light, and he said, well, he picked up one of the flintlocks and said, we show students, you know, how these work and so forth, and he pulled the trigger, and it was loaded. Oh, my gosh. And uh, the people who were having lunch nearby all came running in. <laughs> <laughs> blew out the window, just about blew out our ears. So I'm glad you have that center now. <laughs> um, Thank you. On the uh, on the uh, the program in Zambia, um, mm. I, th I think this is such an unusual and successful program that it, it deserves the, the kind of hearing it's getting. Uh, many years ago, I was with World Wildlife Fund reviewing their programs in Latin America, and they found that working on programs like this where you had to have a, a commercial attitude and, a, and people involved with the private sector was the worst thing they did in their programs. And they stopped doing it, mostly. So I'm interested that WCS is supporting this and finding people like you who have the skills to do this because they're very hard to find in the environmental community. Thank you. Uh, Dale, you can comment if you want to, but I think that was a compliment. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll talk for another hour, so better not. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's, I think the, we're going to work out the microphone, girl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bob Kozak, Advanced Biofuels USA. And I just want to compliment Dale. It, it, see, it took a biologist to come into a situation without the preconceived notions of business to actually figure out the whole system and, and, how, and how it worked. And you know, I mean, that's just really tremendous. And um, what you did, we did, we tried doing something similar in the Peace Corps. So I really feel a tremendous amount of empathy and you know the, the success you've had. I just had a couple questions um, in terms of uh, land tenure, and is there any resale going on now among people? And uh, connected with that, does Kamako provide? loans for people in that direction and also um, in terms of um, the seeds uh, do people buy those up front or is there a loan program or could you go, could you go into uh, a few more details on how that works mm -hmm. I really can't talk too much about land tenure it's not something that we we um, have yet ventured into but it is something that's so important because the areas are vast. The chiefs who are the customary owners clearly don't have the technology to, to track who moves in and out of their area. And so as a result, we, we do get um, uh, what we refer to as encroachment uh, from outside, often because of poor farming by people who are now looking for, for virgin land. So that's a very important part. And I would say perhaps down the road when, when a chief can take on that, we will provide that conservation dividend to the whole community. I mean, somehow we've got to find that kind of reward to doing what's, what's responsible for the land. On loans, we, we, the only loan that we really give are in terms of inputs. Uh, we don't sell. These are poor people. Um, but we are uh, very strict about a, unless there's a drought, but otherwise we expect if we provide seeds uh, as, a, uh, as a loan, uh, our seed recovery, uh, 80 to 85 to 95 percent seed recovery. So that's, that's the beginning of a loan system. And as we monitor the producer groups, if, if they're good producers and, and reliable, that's your sort of gateway for a, a credit system. You know which ones are, are credit worthy. Can I add to that, Dale? Because uh, you weren't clear, it wasn't clear to me anyway. Uh, at the bulking centers, when the producers bring the product in, the, the, the ground nuts, how do you determine that price? that you're paying to the producer. Yeah. Well, we, we look at the uh, commodity prices, and we know pretty much what the commodity says these commodities are. And um, if, if all is well as far as compliance, and we will give as a, our market price will be ab above the market price, 5%, mm -hmm. 10%. Um, that's our deal. Yeah. yeah, that's our deal. And um, that's well publicized. And right now, our team is out in the field. We're sensitizing the communities about what our prices are, making sure that all the systems are ready, um, so that it's in our interest to get the co commodity quickly out of the field. Because the longer it stays in the community, that's when your risk increase, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. So um, it's very public. We put up signs. There's, there's, it's quite transparent. So I hand, yes, right back here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Modekai Ogada from Laikipio Forum in Kenya. 
My question is uh, about the Gorongosa pro program. Now, there, there, there are two things. One, the, the sustainability of the sustainability of people living inside the park while, while, while sharing in the benefits or profits from tourism. I, I fear that uh, you are sharing only benefits but not responsibilities. And I wonder how sustainable that is. Secondly, the, the fishermen that you are talking about. I, I presume there is, as in most uh, fisheries, there is a sustainable level. And um, is it, wouldn't it be a better idea to help them do that, f that fishing in an environmental, a sustainable manner rather than turn them all into tour guides? Because the tourism industry, at least in Kenya, I know is very fickle. And, and um, sometimes, some years, it just dries up. And some people just do not do well in the service industry because of culture because of poor skills, et cetera. So I was just thinking, might it, it be better to take advantage of the skills they do have to enhance their livelihoods? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, and those are, those are good points. Um, I'll, I'll answer the questions backwards on the um, fishermen. I actually just heard about that particular situation this morning. Um, Greg Carr actually emailed me to tell me about it. My assumption was that they certainly would be allowed to continue any sustainable level of fishing, that this was just a way to encourage them not to need to overfish in order to have their income at a certain level, that there were other ways they could they could be involved in the tourism as well as fishing if the fishing were kept uh, to to the appropriate level um, on the on the uh, getting them involved in tourism uh, I think that they're you know they're also being encouraged to do other things um, as I described but um, I, I wonder if I, I don't want to put you on the spot Scott but do you have any comments on what people are doing the people who live in the park um, besides being involved with We'll wait for the microphone, Scott. Tourism. But you don't have to, if you don't have any comments. Scott has not been involved in a while, but he did live in the park and knows a little more than I do. Well, it, it was always my understanding that the people living inside the park um, weren't able to establish the National Resource Management Committee in the same way that buffer zone committees could. Um, they needed to have a charter and a bank account recognized by the park administration in order to do that. And at the time I was there, the park revenues weren't being distributed to communities living inside the park. Mm. Oh. There was one trial community going on where they were working with them to encourage a relocation and setting up a kind of a prototype of a management committee before the relocation took mm -hmm. place. But revenues hadn't gone to any communities inside the park mm. yet. And I think that, um, thanks Scott, and I think that um, you know, it isn't just, they're, they're not being trained just for tourism. You know, they're being trained as healthcare workers and, and you know, sewing the Capulana bags and that kind of thing. So there's a broad range. It is definitely not um, the plan to make the people living in the park dependent on tourism for their own livelihoods. The idea is that tourism revenues overall are going to help that region. Philip Allen, I've been trying to cheer on African development uh, since the 1960s, um, and I'm delighted to have some good news from both of you, uh, and, and congratulate you. But um, the exposés both s seem to suggest that you are working in environments of benign political and governmental uh, structure and co mm -hmm. cooperation. Uh, surely there is some predatory uh, activity, um, certainly in the countries I know better than those two, uh, th there's predatory activity not just by poachers uh, or by um, avaricious traders uh, who, uh, who buy up the products at, uh, at a pittance, but also by people who are uh, in, a pa in a position to create, a, have influence, leverage, and, uh, and, and to try to milk uh, what they can get out of your projects. 
Um, would you would be willing to admit to any of that? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to go first? Well, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I haven't been that closely involved in recent years, but I certainly know that when I was involved, we were doing everything we could to make sure that there was no mechanism for any of the money to go to the government, <laughs> you know, trying to make sure that it was being reinvested by our project into, you know, by our project or the communities, but not going to government figures. And that's, I think that's part of the purpose of those committees. They're not government. They're, they're made up of communities. So in that sense, I know there was a lot of concern about that. One of the nice things about running a company is that you're protected by law. I mean, you are a company, you're, you have uh, your, your rights to operate like any other company, and there's a pretty good clear division between government and companies, at least in Zambia. So you, you can operate fairly independently. You don't want to be too independent, however, because you are a social program and you want political support. And so we work very closely with uh, local government. Uh, because we do a lot of the work of government, you know, in terms of poverty reduction. And so we're very transparent about what we do so we have that good relationship. Um, in, in, in terms of sort of predatory activities of commercial uh, destructive interest, um, it, it is very interesting that if you look at the elephant poaching in the region, and, and I don't have enough information to really analyze this properly, but I know in Tanzania and Mozambique, there's some really serious uh, rates of, of poaching. Uh, since January of this year, we have been flying every couple weeks, every other week, and there's a plane now that we have that we do reconnaissance, and they've not found a single fresh elephant carcass for the whole wet season. What's happening? Well, if you've got external predatory interests coming in, you can't just come in and poach without getting local help. It's very difficult. So if, if people really have handed over their guns and say, we want to make a transition to another life and we're not interested in poaching, in fact, we don't really want to see poachers in our area if they have come that far. And some air communities have. That's a very positive sign. In terms of competition, yes. I mean, food, we couldn't be in a better business. A business. Food is it. And everybody wants that food. So we've, we've got to be out there better organized, better priced, and we have had a problem, what we call side selling. You got a community who doesn't know you too well. In the first couple of years, you will see farmers, they won't wait for you. They'll sell to anybody and they'll hurt themselves. But as they see that you're going to be there and you'll stay there, that will change. We've seen that consistently. It's messy, but there's some structure and some pattern that we're beginning to see if we can learn from. Part of Philip's question may have been <clears throat> kind of the reference I made in my introductory remarks. And that is, uh, but let me frame it as a question, are the lessons to be learned from, from the experiences you are having in rather politically benign situations uh, where you're not in the eastern DRC, it's not Virunga Forest, which is being devastated by armed rebel groups, it's, it's not the very sophisticated poaching systems you have in Kenya, mm. uh, in the Savo and et cetera, where Correct. with the best of government intentions. In the DRC, you also got a government that is... Uh, uh, you know, that is non-functional, so there's not even government support for it. In, in Kenya, I think you have a government that's very conscious of this, but it's just the, the pressures. And pressures, the, overwhelming. Uh, yeah. Overwhelming, yeah. Are there, are there lessons that apply? Uh, well, I, I really... And this uh, maybe goes back to your elephant days rather than your commercial uh, days. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, well, we've, we've, I remember back in the 70s, we, we lost the rhino. We had terribly commercial gangs that came in, and um, the army was involved. Um, they were getting AK-47s uh, into the field and using, you know, exploiting poverty, using poor people to go in and do the dirty work. Um, and I, I think you're, you know, it's it, so much of it is whether or not you can offer a better alternative than these sorts of uh, situations. Um, and and the, it gets back to that supply chain. You've got to be out there because the people that... What motivated me to do this was one day I, I met a gang of poachers who had shot three different family groups just across the river from where I was living. And I thought I was going to go off the, you know, have a rage when I would eventually have a chance to meet them. But it was clear to me that they were just being exploited. And, and so you've got to be out there into these areas and find uh, ways and means to get better markets and alternatives. I, I'm not answering your question because I'm not in Burundi, I'm not in Kenya, and I don't know really 
what they're up against. But we are trying to put a firewall. We're trying to put a development uh, process in place that will make people more responsible and accountable and able to look after their resources. It's not perfect. It'll be penetrated, no doubt about it. But it's not going to be as serious, hopefully, as if we didn't have that firewall. OK. Uh, I think this hand was up first over here. I'm Simon Jones from Solomon International. Um, and I was gonna, you mentioned a number of times brand and marketing as a big part of your, your company. And I was wondering, often that's in conservation and commercial ventures that's often either not considered or kind of considered as an afterthought. And I was wondering if you, if you could elaborate a little bit more on how that has been important to make connecting to the market and also making you successful for the people you're ultimately trying to impact. I don't know, maybe in another life I should have been a shoe salesman or something, but I, I love selling. Um, I, I love getting people excited about something that they feel like they need. And, and I know, and if you look around the food that you buy in Zambia, a lot of it's not healthy. So number one, um, get something that consumers want. It's a good product, healthy. And you gotta be pretty sexy about the way you do this. And uh, I'm very fortunate my wife is an artist and very smart, a lot smarter than I am. She came up with this wild. So we had a good brand. And then you got a dream. You got to say, you know, this is something like General Mills started as a very small company. They made a very big mistake. They admit it. Maybe that's why they're helping us. They've gone through Cargill and working with corporate farms. There are no small farms left in Zambia. I mean, in the States. And we'd have a lot more trees and a lot more natural resources if we had more f small farmers because they're the ones that live on the land. So you get something, you get a mission like that and a, and a brand behind it and, and, and a vision that people can identify with. That's what people gravitate to. They don't want science and all this nonsense. And the institutions that I've come with have been very science-based. I'm, I'm a, an outlier in WCS. Um, I'm, I'm someone that sometimes they don't know what to do with. But I'm trying to get them to understand, also, this is the future. If we want wildlife, you've got to put something, a, a better alternative than poaching. Yeah. I saw a hand right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm Walter Knausenberger with the USAID Africa Bureau here in Washington now, spent many years in Africa. Um, and I wanted to uh, draw out from you, Dale, I mean, both presentations were good, I know Goran Goris as well, but the experience you have uh, mm -hmm. pre conveyed to us here is, uh, I do believe, a, a potential wave of the future. And being that you are a wildlife biologist with a conservation organization, you just, just described how you are an outlier in your own organization, how much of this um, success would you attribute to the insights that derived from the preceding many years of uh, the community-based natural resources management projects that were held uh, c uh, carried out in, in Zambia and, and around Malawi and other places as well? Was that a foundation? Are you working in the same general areas? Are you, in fact, the conservation outcomes here, you didn't really highlight them really other than the poaching issues, which is really quite graphic and important. but. To what extent is this being documented, and other, other than through presentations like this? You know, even the, you mentioned Rotan Lal. I mean, how many people refer to a scient soil scientist in a conservation project that has a commercial, out a commercial dynamic here, and it's as integrated as it is? That is exactly what what's, what's I'm seeing as, as potentially um, groundbreaking as a model for how we can go about integrated you know, development and looking at the whole system. And so you're kind of living it, and it should, it should be documented. So to what extent is that happening? And to what extent are you drawing on the experiences of the 10 plus years of AdMade and other such community-based natural resource management projects? Let me back up a little bit and say that without having an institution like WCS that allowed me to do what I did, would have, none of this would have happened. They, they are, they're very much uh, oriented toward research, so very much of what we uh, do now is m monitoring and, and, and checking the reality. Is it really happening? Are we really adding wildlife? Are we keeping habitat? I think that's the real significance of having an organization like WCS. 
But as a food industry, it's very difficult for WCS to understand why are we running a food, agri a, a food processing business. So I just want to sort of put that in, put that in perspective. So we have become a, a separate company, but um, a critically important partner is Wildlife Conservation Society. But in terms of publications, it is, um, we've reached a very important point that we're going through um, a process now with many partners who want to see this model replicated. And I've been pushing back because we, we weren't ready. And I don't think I can push back much longer. And we're going to need partners. We're going to need other organizations that, that, that might want to take some aspect of how we've created a value chain, pick up a certain piece of it, and collaborate with us in helping, allowing us to perhaps pick up the other pieces of the value chain. Or maybe transporting the whole model and taking up to Uganda, perhaps. There's an interest in having Kamako work around Mount Elgon, for example, on the Ugandan side. And so what we haven't done is we haven't really provided all of the methodologies, all of the lessons, all of the insights, um, protocols and procedures, and all the things that you need to think of, because it's taken us 10 years. And we can certainly shorten that down. So in the coming year, one of our tasks, and it's part, partly why, <clears throat> excuse me, let me uh, a little water, why, um, why I, I will be um, stepping down as the CEO and will be taking up a position of president where my role now will be much more of an advocate, much more of a communicator, much more of a strategic thinking type person in the company working very closely with the CEO to con continue to build the business, which needs somebody with those skill sets, but to make sure the model does respond to the, the challenges that we're all interested in addressing. And having that kind of opportunity uh, is gonna be very exciting for me because that is really what we need to do is to get the, uh, the, 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 the confidence level where people feel like, well, I have heard people say that I'm not gonna run a food business, uh, food processing company. It's crazy, it was way too much work. But, you know, I would say if an elephant conservationist can do it, it can't be that difficult. <laughs> I mean, come on, and, and it can't happen. Um, you just have to take a few risks and, and you know, you will hurt yourself. You, you will, I mean, in my case, I don't take any more fishing trips, but I hope to get back to fishing one of these days. So. We will do that, and we, you will see more publications. We have published in the Proceedings National Academy of Science. Uh, uh, it came out in 2010. Um, we've got a pretty good website that we're trying to, to overhaul now. It's called itswild.org. So I actually just wanted to build off that last question and ask if you both could speak for a minute about increases, for example, in the number of women accessing voluntary family planning services uh, as a result of your interventions. And I did actually want to make one quick comment that I failed to in, um, in my quick introductory remarks, and that is that I really wanted to thank Linda Bruce, the director of the Balance Project, who, who helped um, put today, together today's event. It really wouldn't have happened without her assistance. My pleasure. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't have current data on the family planning. I have volumes of reports I haven't waded through, um, but it's definitely been a huge, huge piece of the project. I know that, and I can dig up that information and get it to you easily. Well, very briefly, the women clearly want it. The men need to be supportive. Um, it's very tied to farming. Um, we can provide better ways of increasing food production, and maybe you don't need as many children. And so the quality of life for your children can improve, better nutrition, and perhaps with the kinds of farming practices, the labor requirements do go down. And so when you tie all the economic reasons why family planning is possible, is good, and that discussion um, one is one that needs to happen probably not at an institutional level, even at a clinic. We find that women are very awkward when they're in a, a foreign setting. It really happens when you're in a 
under the tree, women are together, you've got someone can talk about these things. And we've just gotten into this sort of um, recently, but we see a huge opportunity. We really want to see this go forward. Microphone over here. <laughs> <clears throat> Dale, I'm going to help you out here. Um, By all means. The Balance Project gave WCS um, a, a small seed grant to actually integrate uh, family planning and family health into their, in their, uh, they were they were open to it. They just didn't know how, and we sent some resources down to help them with some financial resources as well. So I'm very familiar with their reports, and the, I will say one thing that it. it the, the folks in the field on PhD projects, it's very difficult to get the kind of data we would really like to, to promote the figures for family planning because it is in conservation groups, the, the, the remote, they don't always see the need for data and, and so it's really sort of hard to squeeze it out, but I can definitely say uh, with conviction that they've spoken to really thousands of women about family planning. The, th they haven't really been as conscientious as ticking off the numbers of how many people have, have received methods, and this is something that I've been talking to Dale about, how do we strengthen that? Uh, because the peer educators, the elite farmers, not only can carry pills for continued users, but they also then make referrals to new users or uh, users who are interested in another method. So I don't think that that referral system is exactly being counted as well as it could be. So they could do a little bit more conscientious way of doing the counting. But having read all the reports quite a bit, and I have to write my own reports on their reports, I can say that they're doing a whole lot of education. And I know that the methods are getting out there because I read about it, but I'm just not getting the data from them. So this is just something, it, it just continues, you just have to continually work with them to get the data and get the Ministry of Health also to provide the data. So it works on both ends. So it's, it's a constant um, struggle, not only for our seed grant with WCS, but with the other, or the four or five seed grants we've given in Uganda and Papua New Guinea and in Ethiopia. It's a similar issue. I beg your pardon? The balance project is a. Yes, okay. Uh, it's a five year uh, project funded by USAID, Office of Global Health, to promote population um, health environment approaches and to build the capacity of conservation health organizations on how to develop integrated approaches um, for addressing um, development issues and uh, addressing those underlying factors that lead to the poverty and lack of food security and poor health. Hey, thank you. I, I don't see another hand waving right now, so I'll, I'll take, a, take a moment and, and, and throw a question your way. Couple. Okay, no, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it, but I already started my question, so I'm taking my time. <laughs> uh, no, and this might take us in a little different direction, but uh, uh, as you were describing your, your scheme, uh, the commercial side of it, uh, Dale uh, uh, Kamako, uh, I was reminded of uh, some of the work that TechnoServe has done, the, mm -hmm. the value added. Mm -hmm. I know you know TechnoServe, but mm -hmm. we, we all know that uh, you know, Starbucks buys some coffees in Africa and, and mm. features them, but what TechnoServe uh, did was, was, was uh, I thought, quite constructive, and that is uh, they have uh, gathered together a group of of, uh, of uh, cooperative farmers, and I think they've got about six or 7,000 farmers now mm. in, in Rwanda, uh, uh, Kenya, mm. and, and mm. Ethiopia. Uh, mm. But they, they went out there to, uh, to work with them in processing the coffee. Mm -hmm. That is both the washing and the grinding, mm -hmm. so that uh, they were able to get a, a finished product that was going for mm -hmm. sale, and then they were able to make a deal with Pete's Coffee for mm -hmm. uh, for actually marketing that in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite different than what uh, what uh, other coffee buyers have done, just taking mm -hmm. the raw bean. Uh, so, uh, so are you thinking of anything further down the line in terms of marketing to the United States? I mean, this looks to me like something that really go over big here. It's wild. Uh, well, you've asked a good question. Um, it's a lot more difficult to market uh, over overseas and, and, and get into such very large uh, value chains, which require so much supply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I, I'm really grateful you brought me here, and I've enjoyed talking with you. But, you know, the audience that I'd really like to talk to um, are the food industries here. Mm -hmm. um, they are, do you know? 
Who owns Kraft, by the way? Kraft is owned by a cigarette tobacco company. You know, they're the people who were poisoning us. Now they fill up their products with uh, salt and uh, sugar and, you know, everything, anything else that makes our food taste so good. That's why our food doesn't taste as good as theirs, uh, perhaps. But what I would, would love to do is have an audience with the CEOs of the three or four big food processing companies and say, come on, um, if we can do what we're doing, a little company, a little speck on the planet, and you guys are the monoliths, can't you come up with an a, a energy bar called It's Wild and, 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 and let this uh, website be known and get some excitement here in the States? And so when you pick up your next energy bar, you will pick up It's Wild, I know. And if they could share 50% of that revenue and put it back into products, projects like Kamako, can you imagine what that could do? And what an uplifting uh, type of um, approach that um, the private sector in this country could do through a food product? That's, that's where I think we, we don't need to t take that energy bar from Zambia over to the States. It, it needs to be done by the guys who know how to do it. That, I, I think that would be great, and I would love for the, you know, the Woodrow Wilson Center to, to think about that proposal, perhaps. <laughs> Let's follow up with the conversation on that, because we do have contacts with a, a lot of the food industry. Okay, back here. Oh, yeah, start here, and then over here. Yeah. Just a quick observation on the, on the, the question about the family planning numbers. If... If the culture there is anything like what it is in Kenya, <clears throat> take the impact on family planning and be thankful for it. The moment you will start going around with notes, taking notes how many women are taking this uh, contraceptive or whatever, taking data, that, 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 then the whole house of cards comes crashing down because of cultural reasons. So the fact that it's grown organically, etc. I'm sorry for those who like taking data, but <laughs> take it and be happy with it, is what I'd say, and keep it going. Very good advice. Thank you. Okay, question here. Hi. I really appreciated both of your um, presentations. It's just so encouraging to see what's going on there. And um, you are. Oh, you I'm are. sorry. I'm Faye Yu. Um, I'm an independent consultant. Um, I've worked with a few economic development projects and a lot of what we tried to do was um, lump in savings groups with it because we found that through um, uh, there's a, a culture of living hand to mouth there's a culture of taking on loans and then paying back and then with the high interest rate blah 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 you you keep families in poverty um, so especially with children's education that you know comes yearly or a big health um, health care demands I'm wondering are there any projects that or ways that you're encouraging um, those that participate, your farmers or in your w different women's groups, that helping them to form savings groups or some kind of savings plan so that when they need to purchase seeds or when they need to pay for their children's health care needs or education, that they don't have to fall into debt. Well, I think now that we have um, groups that um, have money and though it's not a lot of money, it's much more money than they had and it's it's the next step is to organize groups to think about how they can put together their collective savings and loans. I mean, this is all how it all starts. Um, obviously, the, the, the banks are, are not going to be out there for a long time, and the mobile phone banking system is, you know, way, way out there. Um, and it's a development uh, intervention, and I wish we just had, you know, instead of 365 days in the year, we could double that, and we might have gotten to it by now. But we haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, and, and definitely we haven't either. I think, I think we're quite a few years behind uh, Dale's organization, and I, I don't think anybody is at a point where they could possibly save any money. I think that's definitely something that should be in the picture later on, but I think they're still trying to just get by. Okay. More comments? More questions? We still have over 10 minutes. There we go, Philip. <laughs> Philip Allen again. I'm wondering, 
Um, after admiring both of the projects as much as uh, I've been doing, how you're leading um, African collaborators would describe what was going on in either uh, either of, or both of those projects. Would they be using the same uh, value measures as you're using? Um, would they be um, proud of uh, their the uh, of, of the indigenous, the African? Um, uh, contribution to the development, or uh, would there be a tendency to, um, per perhaps I am sounding like a 1960s guy, there. would there be a tendency to say, well, Americans come in with a lot of money and a lot of technology and they can do things, but um, uh, we're not doing it? Fair question. <laughs> Want me? Go ahead. You ask a lot of difficult questions. <laughs> um, again, just because I haven't been there in a while, I'm not sure. But I, I, I do think in some cases, I think it's mixed. I think we, we sense that some people think it's just fabulous and they're very excited and they feel that there's wonderful capacity building and that they're... Uh, that people are really learning how to do things in a different way. And I think there's some who just are very skeptical or cynical and and just think, you know, this is all going to go away. I, I think we, we see both. You know, we are sort of a hybrid because we, we, are, we are commercial and then we're also non-commercial. Um, when you have, um, and we're so thankful for the donor money, but we realize that there are very strict conditions about how it's used and, and, and accountability and, and uh, very, you know, uh, restricted budgets and so forth. And it's, um, and it's not our money. It's someone else's money, though we're very grateful for it. Um, that creates a certain kind of, I think, um, perspective and, and uh, uh, a process of realizing um, that that money will end. When you have a company and you have a business plan, something that you create, a product, and you know it's coming from consumers who now are becoming more of the donor, to sustain something that you feel very part of. And there's a long-term perspective, not a short-term, but a long-term. Then you see an opportunity of moving up into the company. I mean, I'll hand the key over to some, somebody, maybe a Zambian. And that's a real possibility. And, and I think that's the excitement about uh, what we're doing is that it's, it's not a project. There are elements of the project. But there is, there is a long-term future about a national good and a, and a sense of ownership and a sense of being contributing to a better future. And, and that's what I think development needs to be more of, about long-term, where are we going? What kind of vision do we want? Where do we want to be? And that needs to be t communicated by the head of state. So hopefully he'll buy a box of our cereal or a bottle of our peanut butter and maybe I'll get a phone call, and he'll say, you know, Mr. Lewis, can we meet one day? You know, it'd be great. And you've got to keep dreaming like that. It, it can happen. Okay, okay, right behind. It's sort of a follow-up to that, um, to Dale. Um, it, it seems, and I I'm, I'm mean this in a good sense, it's like you're creating the old Midwest of the United States over there, you know, you know, when you had agricultural communities, yeah, that Absolutely. you know, you know that, that was in, they were profoundly middle class. Yeah. And my question is, um, have you picked up or you're noticing any pushback from the elites that the possibility that a, you know, that there's going to be an agricultural middle class that will become politically powerful? Wow. <laughs> Well, um, I'm, I'm still competing with that, that son of a bitch up there who was exploiting the poor farmers, but, and he hasn't shot me yet. <laughs> so there is an element of that. I've been warned, you know, we're not the best of friends. Um, but it's very interesting. Um, the big supermarkets, uh, they're very uh, they're business people. The manager of ShopRite, they've got 21 stores. They've cut back on imported peanut butter by 75%. said, we're making more money from you than we did from the imports keep it going. Um, now they talk. 
and say, well, you know, we're really excited about being able to do something that's also good for the country. They, they have their cocktails. They sit around and talk. I don't know how it gets around, but I haven't seen too much um, bad will um, because we want to be positive. We want to create something that everybody wins, and that's marketing. That's you just got to keep pushing that, and, and Zambians, indigenous Zambians, are our best storytellers, are the best marketing people you could find. And, and they know how to sing it, and they know how to dance it, and we have in-store promotions, you wouldn't believe it. And those in-store promotions are, again, raising awareness of what this brand is all about. Um, it's, it's, it is an evolution. You know, it's it's um, strange what, what we're getting into. I, I never thought of us being Midwestern, and you know, maybe we are. <laughs> I've always been an old fuddy dud, so maybe I am all Midwestern. All right. A lot of 1960s guys here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're we're down to about one last question. Uh, so who wants that uh, that honor? Da, 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 da. We have exhausted our audience, all their curiosity. Ah, here we go. I knew there had to be one more. This is to, to both of you. And I'll ask Dale first, because I know you better, but Catherine, the question is for you as well. Dale, when we first met years ago, you, you, you allowed me just five minutes to speak to you. You and allowed that, what? When we met a couple years ago, yeah. you gave me less than five minutes to speak okay. to you and give my little PhD spiel. And at that point, I was telling you that uh, we were interested, um, that we integrated family planning with conservation. And uh, I got the sense that you were a little bit ears, but you said to me, but we're conservation folks. We don't know how to do that. And I said, you don't have to know. You just find a partner. So my question to you is, what got you to the point where you were open to family and health? It didn't have to be family planning only, but just adding more of a social component. I would pose that question also to the Gordon Sosa folks, is what has, because Greg Carr was in, in, into really bringing in the elephants and, and rehabilitating the park, what brought you to the consciousness of also bringing the social element into the picture? Well, you really can't be a conservationist now without thinking about people. And if you've lived um, for many, many years um, very close to the people that we're helping, as I have, you see the, um, so many children that grow up without an education. Um, and you see how their lives uh, play out. And many of them end up in very serious problems with their health and with occupations that are harmful and destructive and so forth. And <clears throat> you're just being totally irresponsible if you don't um, think the long term for conservation. I mean, catching a poacher is short term. That's not going to stop the problem. If you think long term, you will think about family planning. It's just, you just, you know, otherwise, I don't think you're a conservationist. Um, well, I would say that with our project, it was, it was a big focus from the start. It didn't get as much attention, and perhaps the um, team didn't focus on it as much, but the intention was there from the beginning. And I think maybe we didn't focus on it quite as much or didn't follow through on some of the intent as much initially in part because you know bringing relocating animals and that kind of thing is very sexy and National Geographic came in to do a movie and they were really interested in that and so that that got all the publicity but then actually I'll credit Bill Wright in the audience he worked with USAID to get a um, to get our PEPFAR grant and to get a PHE fellow into the park and it was very, very time consuming, you know, to do that from start to finish. And in fact, none of us was there when it actually started happening. Um, so I think, I think it didn't get as much attention and it's actually now kicking off now, but it, it was always part of the package. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Catherine and Dale. These were wonderful uh, uh, presentations and the work you're doing is most laudable. So uh, let me ask the uh, audience here to join me in thanking them for both what they do and what they gave us today.
We ended five minutes early. My wow. goodness. <laughs> Catherine, nice it to was meet really you. nice to meet yeah, you. It really was, and I hope one day we'll meet again. Yeah, and, uh, no, that would be great. Over, I mean, a, over a whiskey or a beer or something rather than something like this would be nice. Give you my car. Sure. And um, 